All right, so this is uh, Thursday, April 30th. The uh, recording the uh, the lecture for that day for Micro One. So it's a Micro One lecture, and I will post it to uh, I will post it uh, not only to Blackboard, but I also put it up on uh, uh, YouTube because I know I, I, some people have really complained about the bandwidth off of Blackboard for videos and it's been really problematic for them and so I'll put it on YouTube it should be okay all right so what I want to do I want to talk about the final um, I'm not going to talk too much about the project we've been going over that a fair amount in uh, we've been going over that a fair amount in uh, in our uh, in our help sessions are the project and we've been going over that a lot in our help sessions and I'll continue to do that I'll, I will do a help session tomorrow um, we'll do two of them we'll do one at noon and nine so um, feel free to, to log in for that the one at noon is a little less attended so if you need more time that might be good and then you can always come back at nine after you've worked on your code some um, there have been a few questions about lab eight so ideally if you have if you have hardware, you should do it. If you don't have hardware, if you, if you don't even have your Viva board and you don't have a programmer, or you have a Viva board but you don't have a programmer, um, the uh, then you can you can type in uh, in MP Lab the code and you can simulate it. You can run under simulation. Uh, the code's pretty much turnkey. Uh, the starter code's pretty much complete. You don't have to do much. So just go ahead and type that code in and and uh, simulate it, and that'll be fine. Um, and just, uh, I think you can just send it to me, I guess, and I'm going to try and go through. I, well, send it to uh, Trindu and see if, uh, um, and we'll see if that works. I haven't talked to him. I need to do that, I guess. Um, but in any event, um, maybe also send it to me, and I'm trying to make a list of that. All right. Um, and try and get, try and get everything except uh, your project turned in. Uh, I'll send out an email, but I think I said the date for that uh, by by the seventh or no by the eighth. Try and do it. Try and do it early on the eighth. I think I said two p.m. So try and do it by two p.m. on the eighth. Okay, um, and then the final will be on the seventh. So that way, hopefully on the eighth, I can work on some numbers and give you an idea of what your grade's likely to be. Uh, I'm not committing myself to getting that done. I don't know if it's possible because I've got. <clears throat> three courses where the students all want that information. That's about 300 students. It's just not easy to do that in a few hours. It takes more time than that, typically. All right, so let's talk about the final. And um, so I think uh, this is it. And I'll shrink me down a little bit. Okay. That's great. So difficult. We'll make it this just a little bit bigger, and then we'll go down here. And I knew that was going to do that. See what happens. Okay, that's pretty good. All right. Okay, so um, so this is one from a few years ago, and. Uh, it's just two pages, uh, and the reason for that was I, I put a lot of weight in the course on the final project, which this year has been hard to do because you know a lot of students didn't have hardware and stuff to work on, and of course they needed um, probably needed more help than they could get. So, all right, so let's go. Through, I, so I'm probably going to expand the number of questions. I don't know. Maybe maybe this will be what I'll have. All right. So the first one, and let me put on some glasses so I can see what I'm doing. Okay. I guess I can use uh, these other ones. Yeah, that's probably better. Okay. So, um, this, this, so the first question is to refer to general principles of embedded designs using microcontrollers. So, um, check check with an X things that are truly typical differences between microcontrollers and microcomputers. So of course, microcomputers are the chips that that sit in your laptops, desktops. Uh, that uh, are made by um, 
AMD and uh, Intel. And they mostly run the IA32 um, uh, uh, instruction set. So, uh, so anyway, so and microcontrollers are things like the PIC 16F 1829 that we used, or even the KL25Z that we didn't get around to using. So they have GPIO pins only on the microcontroller. Yes, that is true. The microcomputer doesn't have GPIO pins. It has buses that connect to the uh, the um, to the graphics processor, to the memory, uh, and to uh, plug-in cards. Uh, so it has pins that drive these buses, but it and it has lots of pins to do that. Uh, it has lots of pins for addresses, for the memory, um, but it does not have pins that can say, for instance, drive an LED. Uh, doesn't have that. Um, have a program counter register uh, only on the microcontroller. Uh, let's see. Check with an X things that are truly typical differences between these two. Okay, so it's kind of a poorly written question anyway. But have a program counter register only on the microcontroller. Well, no, that's not true. Program counters are absolutely on, on both microcomputers and microcontrollers. On the microcomputers, they have multiple cores. Every core has got a program counter. So it's a little more complicated, but yes, they do, they do both have program counter registers. Deploy uh, the microcontroller uh, with a stable, static, small program. Yes, that is true. Uh, we typically have many different programs we run under an operating system on a microcomputer, such as Words, maybe a browser, uh, maybe you're running uh, MATLAB or MPLAB X or something. Whereas on a on a microcontroller, we typically have embedded we, we typically have the firmware that we write and we put, program the microcontroller with that firmware and then we ship it. And the user doesn't change programs and do different apps or anything like that. Now, uh, as things get more and more complicated, I suppose it could happen. We we might start seeing that even with microcontrollers because some of them are pretty powerful, and some of them are working with real time operating systems. That, could, that might have multiple threads running. Some of them even do have multiple cores. So uh, we might see that at, in, at some point. But uh, typically, the vast majority of embedded applications, no, we wouldn't see that. Um, have built-in pulse width modulation modules only on the microcontroller. Yes, that is a difference. Have interrupts only on the microcontroller. No, the uh, microcomputers and microcontrollers both use interrupts extensively. And, um, and so it's not a feature unique to microcontrollers. Require large amounts of external memory only for the microcontroller. No, that's not true at all. Uh, the, the, the microcomputer uh, uses gigabytes of external memory. Uh, so, and we don't necessarily, we, you know, usually we only have kilobytes of external memory for the microcontroller. Okay. Um, so uh, C and C++ are high-level languages. True. Uh, if you are managing a project using an embedded controller, you would expect that the interface to the controller will likely take more time to complete than the software development part of the project. So that's really the hardware interface. Again, poorly written question. But so the quite, what I'm trying to ask is, what's more, what's more likely to hold up your ship and your product? Your firmware or getting the hardware to work? Um, and the answer is almost always it's the firmware. Usually, uh, usually designing the circuit board and getting all the hardware interface correctly it is pretty straightforward. Getting the firmware that controls things and runs it properly, that's always, typically at least, the, la the last completed task. It's what we call, quote, the long pole in the tent, uh, the thing that kind of sticks up and holds everything up. All right. Um, so. Check with an X each of the items that are valid design considerations for an embedded design. So pick a microcontroller with the built-in needed module. Sure, yeah, as much as you possibly can, you'd want to pick a microcontroller with all the available modules that you're thinking about using. Uses a fast 32-bit processor for every application. Yes, you would want to do that. Um, so um, the... Uh, uh, well, I, it, it's not necessarily critical. There, you might definitely find yourself uh, doing an embedded design with a much smaller, much cheaper chip um, that 
was maybe an 8-bit chip like your PIC. The PIC's very powerful. It can do lots of things. You don't really have to have a 32-bit processor. I will say it is somewhat true that the 32-bit processors don't cost that much more than some of the 8-bit processors, although I, I haven't priced them. Um, but the KL20, the 80-pin KL25Z we use, I don't know, it's probably 3 bucks or something. I don't know. I should look that up. But uh, in any event, uh, it's not ridiculously expensive because the whole Freedom Board is only about 14 or $15. So, um, however, the chip we're using is only uh, about $1.25, and there are slightly cheaper ones. And, and, of course, in volume, it would be about a dollar or less. Um, the cost of the microprocessor chip, uh, so you'd have to, so the cost of the microprocessor chip, since it may vary widely between chips and is a big cost component. Well, it depends on what you're doing. In many cases, the one the dollar or so, or maybe less than a dollar that the that the microprocessor chip costs could be a small fraction of your embedded design costs. Uh, so, uh, so again, not a great question. But generally, uh, you, if you're making you know hundreds of thousands of them, then you might be very cost sensitive for you know every few cents here and there. Uh, but in many cases, the cost of microprocessors it, it, it's not necessarily the biggest cost. How familiar you are with the IDE and debug tools available should influence your choice. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you you want to you you'd like to minimize your learning curve, and obviously, if you already know. The, the integrated development environment and your debug tools really well uh, from other projects, you would really like to use a similar chip, maybe one in the same family if you need some different functionality, but still you'd, you'd really like to use uh, a similar chip. So ideally, you would get started on a chip that, that had lots of capability and could be used for lots of different projects. And then you could uh, uh, shift around, uh, you, you would be able to use the same chip, the same development tools for every project or for many of your projects, and that would definitely be helpful. How extensive and varied the family of related processors there is so you can do projects with similar chips? Sure. So you would like to have a line of chips where, uh, where you could pick a, from a number of very, very similar chips with just slightly different configurations to make your development life a lot easier as from project to project. So you don't have to start all over with an entirely brand new line of chips. Um, so yeah, that that would be important. And finally, another consideration that you should take into consideration is when, depending on the likely lifetime of your of your embedded design, how long it's likely to be around, how expensive it is in the end, um, you might want to be uh, you might want to select a line of of products where you're very confident that these chips will be available for many, many years to come. A lot of microprocessor development companies um, will discontinue lines of their chips. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll basically let them just, uh, uh, they'll get to the point where they're not selling very many and they'll just, they'll just stop producing them and never produce any more. And this is not such a big deal if it's, say, in a toaster. Okay, you throw it away and for 40 bucks you get a new toaster. What if it's in a one and a half million dollar missile. A little bit different story, right? And what if what if uh, you know that missile's being stored, and uh, it might be stored for ten years before it gets used, and then uh, when you're checking it and uh, doing self testing on it, it turns out that the, uh, that there's a microprocessor chip on it that's gone bad. And then you check, you want to put it, you want to put a new one in to fix it, uh, and they're out of production. That's a problem. And uh, I actually know firsthand the Air Force ran into these problems. And when they went to the manufacturer and talked to them about uh, producing some more of these chips, uh, the, you know, that originally maybe cost a dollar or two, the manufacturer goes, sure, we'll make some more for you. We'll charge you about $1,000 a piece for them. Uh, and so what, what the Defense Department did, what the Air Force did, was uh, set up a lab where they could configure uh, where they could make their own chips that would be pin for pin compatible and functionally similar uh, using using a more modern uh, microprocessor die, um, and um, so when they showed the manufacturers they had that capability on a product or two, uh, then all of a sudden the manufacturers became a little more reasonable. But the point is this: Why would you want to pick a chip that's likely to go out of production? So you should look and see. Uh, 
how, how long does a company keep a, a particular chip line in production? And uh, those are some questions you need to ask. Turns out, believe it or not, one of the things I like about microchip, every chip they've ever made, they still produce. Now, as they become more and more legacy, the price creeps up a little bit by a dollar or two or whatever, but it doesn't, they don't go into uh, price gouging. All right, uh, so uh, number two there. Questions refer to the programmer's model of a PIC enhanced design mid-range processor, namely the PIC 16F1829. This truce register is part of the core registers. No, it's not. Uh, the core registers that you should know are the W register, the program counter low, the program counter latch high, the uh, program counter, uh, uh, the status register, uh, and the bank select register. Now there are also the indirect registers, um, which you could, uh, which are part of the core, but we never really studied or used, so I'm not expecting you to know those. But the ones I mentioned, those are the ones you should definitely know. The status register contains the three condition codes. What are they? Well, so they're uh, the zero bit, the digit carry bit, uh, and the carry bit. So, so it'd be the first choice. The add instruction always, uh, the add instructions always add in the carry bit, true or false. Well, that's false because there's two different add instructions. There's add with carry and add without carry. So you get, you get to take your pick. If you're adding, say, uh, several bytes together, you start with the low order byte and you don't add with carry for that byte. But then the next byte you do add with carry. And if there was a carry out of the first edition, then the carry bit will be set correctly and you can just do add with carry for the next two bytes and then add with carry again for the last bytes. And then you can check the final carry to see if you overflowed, assuming you're adding unsigned numbers. If you're adding signed numbers, then that doesn't work. Now you have to do another test. Uh, the go the go to instruction cannot branch as far as the BRA instruction. No, it's just the other way around. The go to can branch, but it's got a it's got a couple more bits for its uh, its two's complement offset than the BRA instruction does. Uh, although we did not use the indirect registers in our program, you can use these in assembly programs, and they are extensively used in C programs by the compiler. Yes, that's true. You certainly can use them in assembly programs. I've definitely done that, but uh, but. It, it just adds a, uh, a level of confusion I kind of wanted to avoid. Um, and, uh, but C does use them extensively. In fact, it, almost everything is indirectly addressed. When an instruction references data memory, it uses the address in the instruction combined with five more bits address in a special register to get the actual address. Yes, that's right. Seven bits in the instruction, five in this special register to give a 12-bit result. So the final address is how many bits? Well, seven plus five is 12. Um, and that would, and the special register, the BSR, the bank select register. When you perform any math operation, you have your choice of where to leave the result. What are the two choices you have? You have W or F. That's correct. Where is the data for the for an immediate instruction stored before it's used? It's used in program memory. It's stored in the in the instruction itself, which is of course in program memory. What condition codes uh, does the move F instruction affect? The move F instruction uh, affects the zero bit, the zero uh, code. It doesn't affect the carry or digit carry. And it is a way, it, it has no, if you do move F comma F, it doesn't do anything except test it for whether or not it's zero. Uh, the following questions refer to the general structure of the PIC 16F1829. In a hardware machine, is the address bus used for both instructions and data, and therefore not as fast? No, that's that's uh, yes. That it, it it's true. It, well, in a hardware machine, you have two address buses and two data buses. One for program memory, and the other two are for for data memory. So in our ours chip is a hardware chip, so it has two address buses, one that goes to program memory and one that goes to data memory, and it has an 8-bit data bus for data memory, but a 14-bit data bus for program memory because our 14 our, our program memory is 14 bits wide. The word the word width in the program memory is 14 bits, and in data memory it's 8 bits. The address bus is also different. 
uh, it's it's 15 bits for data uh, sorry for program memory and it's 12 bits for data memory all right the program memory bus is 8 bits wide that is false the same move F instruction can load data from RAM into a W register or it can load data from port B into the W register that's correct the the same move F instruction works for registers and and uh, and ports and it also works for uh, random access memory on the PIC 16F 1829 the size of program memory is 8k words that is true and those words are 14-bit words if we store data in the EEPROM it will be destroyed when the chip is powered down. No, that's the whole point of the EEPROM. It, it is, uh, I think it's 128 uh, bytes, and uh, the, or maybe 64. Anyway, it's not too many. I think it's 128. But anyway, that, that, the, the data in the EEPROM can be written and read, erased and rewritten, and that data um, stays even when the chip is powered down. So it's non-volatile storage. Now, it is true you can... You can also write program memory, but it's a little trickier, and and it's not as convenient. And uh, you write, you can write, I guess, 14 bits, but you can't read 14 bits. You can only read 8 bits, so it's a little screwy. So if you want to save data, generally we do use the EEPROM. Um, we haven't used that feature, but it's there. The following question refers to the hardware stack. The PIC-16 uses a 16-level hardware stack, which limits the depth of nesting calls for, to functions or interrupts or whatever. Um, and yes, that is absolutely true. You, that's why the XC8 compiler does not let you write a, a function which can call itself. Uh, in C, that's perfectly legal, but yeah, that's one of the exceptions to ANSI C in XC8 compiler. When you execute execute a return instruction from the program, when you sorry, when you execute a return instruction, the program counter gets loaded from the stack. That is true. A relo a relocatable software stack is considered more powerful than a hardware stack. Yes, that's absolutely true. Uh, so uh, your desktop, laptop, all the cores have maybe even multiple stack registers. One for the one for t each task, uh, or at least one for tasks and one for uh, uh, system level functions uh, in in uh, in the uh, in the KL 25 Z we have a relocatable stack um, there's a stack register a stack register that basically points to the top of the stack when you use that as in, we use that to indirectly address the stack uh, in the pick it doesn't work you know it has a very limited it only has 16 levels and it's a separate area of uh, memory completely um, and uh, so when you do things with the stack you are limited um, to just you can you can you can do 16 calls and on the 17th call you're overriding the first saved location so you'll never get back to where you started if you do that so there's there that is that is a limit on this processor it's not it's not a super bad limit but you can only nest your functions uh, 16 deep and that includes if you use interrupts that would take one that's one of those levels so um, so yes a relocatable stack is more powerful okay these refer to uh, configuration words what did we set the F oscillator to we set it to internal oscillator um, these others are our settings for external clocks uh, clock chips and resonators and other things and depend on what frequency we're running them at are the configuration bits stored in program memory or data memory or the EEPROM? They are stored in program memory. We specify master clear on was set to on because this enables uh, the RA3 pin to be used as an output. No, the RA3 pin is the master clear pin and you can turn master clear off and then use RA3 as a input. You cannot use it as an output, but it can be an input. But if you do that, you give up having your uh, being able to use it as a debug feature. So, so we want to use our uh, Snap programmer debugger to debug our programs, and so we're we're just we just leave uh, RA3 dedicated to be master clear. So in our configuration word, we specify master clear on. We don't use uh, CP or CPD. That's code protect or code protect data because we're not worried about our code or data being stolen. Yes, that's right. We're, we, we, 
when if you actually you know spend a lot of time on a embedded design and then you ship it you don't want some other company uh, being able to buy your product dig in uh, get get your chip out put it in a program or debugger and read your program um, they they wouldn't get to see your original source code of course they would just be able to see the assembly language that was compiled into so but they could take that and they could decompile it and basically begin to get at um, they could they could basically reverse engineer your 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 design um, so we don't want people doing that uh, if we spend a lot of time on our embedded on our firmware um, so we can turn on the code protect code protect data bits and it will protect that uh, a nice feature of the IDE is that it generates the instructions uh, for the configuration words and we just have to paste it into the code once we're once we choose all our settings yes you can you can pull up uh, from memory views configuration words and then you get a little window that opens up down in the uh, announcement pane and you can then select uh, all the settings for each configuration word and then you can hit uh, um, um, generate code and it will and you can paste it in um, the following referred to the IDE MPE lab, the Integrated Development Environment MP lab X, actually, MP lab X. Um, what tool do we use to write programs? Well, we used MPASM and XC8. A breakpoint will stop the program and show you where in the program you stopped. Yes, that's true, and we call that source level debugging. Okay, you can actually see your source code as you as you step through your program line at a time. Can you power a chip? Uh, with the picket three uh, well with your snap uh no you can't you can the picket three you could power it with the snap you cannot it's one of the differences snaps faster in the way it programs but it, it doesn't have the ability to provide power to the board if you want to use the debugger you have to compile specifically for that choice that is true it's one of the things one of the one of the things that i would prefer weren't the case but that is how it is when in the debugger you can change the values in memory directly yes you can you can definitely do that um, what is the maximum milliamps that a digital pin on, on the 16F 1829 can source? And it can sync or source 25 milliamps. What is the purpose of the register, uh, sorry, of the resistor in the LED circuit? It's current limiting or voltage limiting? Well, I guess that's a little screwy, but it, it is definitely current limiting. Um, so we're, the LED will work with a range of voltages, but uh, what you want to do is 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 obviously limit the current now the current limiting obviously drops voltage across that resistor and the way it works it basically controls the current through the led by limiting the voltage so i guess it's six of one and a half dozen another probably not the greatest question but we normally call those current limiting resistors we use a pull-up resistor on the master clear a pin for the chip because if it so it's pin for ra3 okay because if it goes low, the program will be halted. Yes, that's true. So we pull it up with a 10K resistor to VDD, and then we pull it we, we pull it all the way to ground when we want to stop the programmer. The, uh, the program. The, the, the snap programmer debugger does the same thing. That's how it single steps through. What device on the board limits switching noise in the PIX16F 1829? So we have bypass capacitors uh, on the... Uh, uh, right next to the chip we have two of them uh, uh, one in, uh, that's a few uh, micro uh, uh, microfarads and then we have one that's a few uh, picofarads and or maybe nanofarads I forget but in any event uh, one of them's better uh, at uh, handling big cor big current surges that the chip might have and the other one's better at filtering out high frequency noise um, if developing an embedded design for battery-powered portable use, what are some of the very important parameters of your microcontroller versus those not so important? So we, we definitely we definitely would like, if, if you're using a battery, then we're probably going to use sleep mode. And if we use sleep mode, we would like low-power sleep mode available. High speed, not so much. I mean, it depends on what the task is and the design purpose, but, but it needs to be fast enough to get done what you want to get done, but extra speed is not really helpful. Complex instruction set. No, not really. Able to run at uh, 5 volts? Um, not necessarily. Able to run on variable voltages? Yes, that's that's much more important. We would like it to be able to run over a, a range of voltages, so as the battery loses its charge, uh, it'll still run. Brownout protection? Yes, brownout protection is really important. Let me explain that. 
uh, I know we've talked in class about it, but let me just go through it again. So as the battery voltage drops, there'll be a point where the chip will stop working, right? Uh, and in this chip, it's like one point something. Uh, below 1.8, I think it's questionable. Um, well, so what about when it gets down to 1.7? Still working. What if it gets down to 1.65? Well, it's still working. What if it gets down to 1.6? Well, now some instructions work correctly, but maybe some don't. So what happens is it might start, it might continue to run, but it might start uh, uh, mis-executing some instructions. And as a result, uh, it might do unpredictable things. It might overwrite your firmware. It might, uh, it might uh, send signals out that you don't want that could do damage to devices. Um, like it, you know, it, so because you want it to fail gracefully, you do brownout protection. So when the brownout protection detects the voltage dropping below a certain point, like 1.8 volts, it knows that although the chip might still be able to run, it knows that that it, it, it could also run erratically at those lower voltages. So what the brownout protection does, it prevents the chip from running below that voltage. And so that basically keeps your, that allows your chip as the battery uh, discharges, allows your chip to gracefully stop executing and not to, uh, not to, to stop executing in an ungraceful way where it might do some erratic things that could cause problems. Uh, what is VDD uh, we are using for this pick? Well, we, we, can, we have a jumper that selects between five volts and 3.3 volts. What does the reset switch on the board act you built actually do when you press it? Well, okay, so because we have a jumper on it, it depends on how you've set the jumper. If you set the jumper uh, on the uh, master clear side, then it pulls the master clear pin to ground. And when you let go, the 10K pulls that master pin up, the VDD, and lets the chip run. If you have it on the RB7 side, then it there's a resistor that kicks in that pulls up RB7 uh, to, to VDD when the, when the switch is not pushed. And when you push the switch, you pull RB7 to ground. The voltage regulator on the board drops the battery voltage of 9 volts to 3.3 volts, or we have now two regulators, back when I gave this test when they had one, and now we have a 5.0 volt regulator. So, so both regulators are connected to the 9 volt source and provide 3.3 volts and 5 volts all the time. It caught these, This linear regulator causes some problems. Check how they apply. Well, it, in, in both cases, uh, well, in the case of 3.3, it wastes more power than the processor uses. In the case of the 5 volts, it almost waste as much power as the processor uses. Uh, since you drop 4 volts across the regulator and 5 across your microprocessor at 5 volts, you're slightly doing, you're slightly burning more power in the microprocessor than in the regulator. But it's close. 4 volts versus 5 volts. Can only supply 20 milliamps. No, the regulator can supply up to an amp or so. Causes large voltage swings if power requirements change. No, that's the whole point of the regulator, is to uh, provide a constant power, a constant voltage uh, over a wide range of currents. Um, and it's pretty good at doing that, but you can't exceed its capability. If you short it out, then what it's supposed to do is just shut down gracefully, and it kind of does. Uh, can get hot at maximum power levels. Yes, it can. The one we have uh, that's that's a uh, SOT23 package and is and is uh, actually it's a SOT SOT223. Uh, it's mounted directly to the board, and so that copper on the board is a really good heat sink and spreads the heat uh, through the board pretty well. Uh, so uh, so it, but it still can get hot. Requires its own capacitors to work its design. It is supposed to have. Uh, capacitors on the input and output, and and we 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 do. Okay, well I think that's all the questions. So let's see. So it's been about 34 minutes. Um, so I do have another test. I'll probably I may go through. Uh, 
I might, uh, I'd probably do a help session maybe, uh, or well, so tomorrow uh, in the help session, I'll probably talk a little bit about the final two if uh, there's not other things going on. So I'll, I'll, I'll discuss some things. So, uh, so it'd, be, it'd be worth your while to do that. Uh, I will give a very, very short quiz at the end. I may make it just a one question quiz. So um, uh, I, don't, I don't think I'll make it extensively. I kind of like to do it uh, just to see who actually did watch the lecture. Um, all right, so any questions, yes or no? All right, we will see you later.